My name is Shauna Bodeway. I'm the Director of Programs and Information at Hydrocephalus Canada, and I will be the moderator for tonight's session. In today's session, our guest speaker will be discussing skin breakdowns and solutions for management and prevention. And we are very fortunate tonight to have our guest speaker, Amy Mullen. Amy is the ambulatory care nurse for the spina bifida spinal cord injury clinic at Holland Blurview Kids Rehab Hospital. She has 17 years of nursing experience in pediatric rehabilitation and specialized orthopedic development. Her passion is helping children with disabilities thrive and live their best lives. She is actively involved in quality improvement for the prevention of pressure injuries in both hospital and community settings and has the passion for family-centered care. By taking a solution-focused approach to care, she teaches and educates clients and families on the importance of reaching goals to live a fulfilling life full of possibilities. Amy, thank you for joining us tonight. We are so pleased to have you share your knowledge and expertise with the hydrocephalus and spina bifida community on this topic. And I am going to turn the mic over to you. Thank you so much, Shauna and the team uh, for inviting me to speak. So um, yeah, for the community that I serve, skin is one of the main concerns that we address. So when uh, Shauna asked me about um, doing this presentation, I was just like, yes, I am here. I have lots of, lots of tips. So um, moved here. All right. So essentially caring for your skin 101. Um, so for this presentation, we'll define skin breakdown, discuss reasons, you know, why skin bre breakdown happens more often um, in communities of spina bifida um, and hydrocephalus, identify the many causes of breakdown, and then, of course, uh, how to prevent and then treat those. So a quick just spina bifida 101. Um, with, with the spina bifida, the big thing that we'll focus on tonight is um, just the reasons why um, a lot of skin down break skin breakdown happens um, is the loss of sensation in those particular areas. And so with spina bifida, um, the uh, formation of the spine and the spinal cord um, can cause those nerves to not get full sensation. Um, and then that can lead to uh, decreased sensation, which can then lead to skin breakdown later on. We'll go and I'll go into that uh, a little bit further um, in the latter parts of the session. I don't know why it's not working. I'm hitting my buttons. There we go. Um, so I'm sure most of you know that skin is the actually the largest organ in the body and its main function is protection. So whenever that is damaged, it, you know, it allows infection to get in and uh, we want to prevent that at all costs. Broken boundary, skin breakdown, we want to prevent that. So for the sensation, um, the nerve endings that we have, they respond to pain, touch, heat, um, all of those different things, and they protect us. Um, the, the example that I like to give is when a person steps on a Lego, because I step on lots of Legos that my son leaves out, um, and that's, that's a lot of pain. Um, and then at the same time, that reaction makes us pull away from that to um, prevent opening or breaking down that skin. With spina bifida, spinal cord injury, um, some of those nerves don't get that signal. So with when that signal isn't happening, you don't pull away. And so that um, level of sensation, whether it's full sensation or whether it's just certain spots that have decreased or no sensation, um, can cause you to um, put pressure where you don't realize and then can cause the skin to break down. It can happen with heat, cold, pain, pressure, scrapes, and even moisture. So as we were talking about previously, um, I wanted to put this photo in because it just shows the different uh, types of spina bifida and then how that affects the actual spinal cord um, and the nerves and the sensation that run down to the lower part of your um, of your body, causing that decrease or uh, lack of sensation in those areas. All right, for hydrocephalus, um, so when that excess of cerebral spinal fluid builds up in the ventricles, it results in the enlargement of the ventricles, which then causes pressure. 
that will result, result in the physical consequences, which are the leg weakness, um, unsteady walk, gait, limited uh, fine motor controls, um, which can then, as we'll get into a little bit later, lead to that skin breakdown piece. I'm just going to skip the next one. Um, another um, condition that we see uh, with um, our kids that have spina bifida and then also um, adults is tethered cord. And so the spinal cord itself is free flowing in, uh, in, in the fluid. It's not supposed to be attached to anything. Um, but, but with um, spina bifida or spinal cord injury, you can have scar tissue at the site where the neural tube defect is. And as you grow, um, those cords that you see just at the end there, right here, um, can attach themselves to either a fatty piece or can attach themselves to the scar tissue. When that happens, as the cord is stretched, it irritates the nerves. And the reason I bring this up is because you can see certain changes. You can see bladder and bowel changes, um, where as previously you may be totally continent, you may start to see urinary tract infections. You may um, start having bowel or bladder accidents where you weren't before. That is, um, that's going to cause excess moisture, which could lead to skin breakdown. For back and leg and foot changes, it could, if you're having um, back and leg changes, that could cause more tripping, more stumbling, more abrasions, more risk of skin breakdown. And then for scoliosis, um, the same thing. It can cause um, extra pressure in certain areas. If you have a wheelchair that is molded to fit you, and then you start to develop a more severe scoliosis, that means that the chair no longer is molded to um, your spine, and that can cause pressure in certain spots that can lead to breakdown as well. So as I mentioned before, um, with um, the tethered cord, and uh, even without tethered cord, but you can have uh, a neurogenic bladder with um, spinal cord injuries and with uh, spina bifida. And so with the neurogenic bladder, the small, the like small spastic and large flaccid doesn't really, um, you don't really need to know that part, but the piece about getting continents under control so that you do control that moisture is really big in trying to prevent pressure uh, or uh, opening of the skin and skin breakdown. Same for neurogenic bowel. And so because of that decreased sensation, um, if there is moisture from either bowel or bladder, um, the acid from stool, it can cause the skin to break down. Okay, so I'm sure all of you have seen um, slides just like this, where areas that are most prone to pressure injuries um, are going to be the bony areas of the body. And the reason for this is because when you have a bony area, you have pressure coming from the inside on top of that bony piece, and then wherever you are putting the pressure. If it's on your ears and you're laying here, you're having pressure there. Um, if it's on, you know, when you're sitting and it's on your tailbone, your heels, if you're lying down. Um, and so those are the areas that you really need to watch for that extra pressure. So the big question, how can I protect my skin and or my child's skin? So first and foremost, prevention is everything. Um, and, and it's a lot easier to um, get into the routine of uh, doing the things we'll discuss later to prevent skin breakdown than it is to actually heal once the skin has already broken. Um, and the biggest thing is to address any causes um, of breakdown, any things, any of the things that may cause skin breakdown and then treating it um, rather than just, you know, oh, I've got, a, uh, I've got, you know, an opening in my skin. I'm just going to cover it up and I'm going to go about my day. You have to figure out where that pressure is coming from um, because it's not going to solve the issue. It's going to continue to happen or it's just going to make um, that area worse if you don't address the actual cause. All right, so how can you protect the skin? Skin checks regularly, so in the morning and at night. 
Um, for your kids, we recommend that you teach them um, at, at a very young age, like you get them started because it's their body and they need to um, work this into part of their routine. So every morning, you know, when they uh, take off their pajamas and they're getting into their clothes, teach them how to, you know, if you've got a stand up mirror, use a handheld mirror to check all of those areas on that, um, the previous slide with all the little dots showing the pressure, teach them um, how to check those areas. And what you're checking for um, are areas that are red that don't go away after there's no pressure on them. So if you're wearing your AFOs and you take them off and you've got some red areas on you know, certain um, bony prominences, that's normal. If after 30 minutes, those reddened areas don't go away, that's when you wanna watch for skin breakdown. Uh, another important thing is to keep the skin clean and dry. So moisture from urine, stool, sweat, it can damage the skin if it's left there too long. Um, certain areas are the feet, the buttocks, and the groin. Um, wear proper footwear, both inside and out, <laughs> to prevent any bumping or scraping. Especially with summer coming up, um, a lot of kids will come into the center and have um, open skin because they've been at the pool or they've been outside without um, without shoes. And, and I get it. Um, you know, they want to run around in the grass and they want to play in the pool and all of those things can be done. Um, but we highly, highly recommend pool shoes or water shoes in the pool and, um, to always wear shoes when, um, when you're outside and inside, um, with inside you, you know, I, I actually wear, I have a pair of shoes that I wear inside because I'm constantly bumping my, my toes constantly. Um, and so for a lot of our, our kids, um, you know, when they're trying to get around the house, whether they're crawling or whether they're, um, you know, bum scooting or they're going along the wall, knocks and scrapes can happen if, if you don't have, uh, if you don't have shoes on the same thing, if, um, you aren't wearing socks. So, um, for our kids who do get around the house by bum scooting or by crawling, they um, don't necessarily wear shoes, but many times if they haven't been wearing socks or something to protect their feet, we have a lot of abrasions on the top of the feet. So again, prevention is key. You want to make sure you prevent the skin from opening in the first place. Um, another thing that people don't necessarily think think about is uh, nutritious foods and drink plenty of fluids to keep the body and skin healthy. Again, we'll go over that in um, some later slides. Um, so I was just uh, talking about the feet and legs covered up when walking, crawling, swimming. Um, the wear socks to um, inside out to prevent the seam from causing pressure um, because it's really interesting just the smallest amount of pressure um, when it's on all day when you're you're not wiggling your feet or you can't feel I know sometimes if my sock is in a weird the seam is in a weird place it will irritate me and so I have to move it if you don't have the sensation then you're not going to move it it's going to continue to put pressure so if you wear your socks inside out you don't have that seam um, another thing, if you have very sweaty feet, especially if you, if you have AFOs on because they're plastic, they sweat, you know, in the summer, especially, um, there are moisture wicking socks that are really good to pull that moisture away from the skin um, to help with that moisture sitting on top of the skin. Um, for the AFOs, we do recommend that you purchase shoes large enough to prevent pressure on the top of the foot. So when it says a deep toe box, that means one that's the, the top of it has a lot of, of room. So you don't want to get really narrow shoes where it fits the width, but it doesn't fit in height. Um, because you do want to make sure that once you get, you know, the AFO in, that it's not putting pressure on the top of, of the foot. So when your braces, um, especially when you get new braces, um, or if you notice that uh, they're starting to get a little small, um, you know, as, as kids grow, they are going to grow out of them faster. Um, the skin checks at the morning and the skin checks at night are really, really important because as kids are growing, um, those AFOs that once fit perfectly and cause no red spots are going to start to cause red spots. If, you know, they have the brace and the toe starts to 
grow out around them and their toes are over is going to put pressure on the underside of their toes. So it's really important to make sure that those braces are fitting. Are they rubbing on the ankle? Are they rubbing on the heel? Um, are they too big and it's it's not fitting properly and so it's going back and forth causing a shearing kind of um, uh, redness and irritation that could break down the skin. For other equipment such as uh, wheelchair cushions and air mattresses, always make sure they're fully inflated. Um, quite often when kids will come in and they have like um, an injury to their tailbone, um, the OT and I will work together because more often than not, there's something going on with the wheelchair or sitting. Um, so it's either wheelchair or it's um, a commode for toileting. And we'll, we always check the, um, the mattress. So, um, and many times we find that it's not fully inflated. So again, you can't necessarily feel that there's pressure that it's deflated. So always make sure to check your equipment the, uh, and that the equipment and the mattresses are fully inflated and that uh, the equipment is working properly. So if you use a commode for a bowel routine, we highly recommend using a padded seat um, and also making sure that the opening of the commode, um, you're not falling through it. So especially for kids, they do make reducer rings that you can put on top of the toilet um, and making sure that, you know, the feet are elevated on a, a stool um, so that you're in proper body alignment and there's no, um, you can offset any pressure and um, make sure that there's not more pressure going on one part. So when sitting for a long period of time, make sure to shift your body weight regularly, okay? Again, for me, when I'm sitting, my, you know, if I start to feel my bum go numb, I'll shift in my seat or I'll get up and I'll move. Um, and so you have to just be aware that, you know, every 20, 30 minutes or whatever, just, just shift, you know, look, lean back and forward, do something side to side. You can lift up on your arms. Um, it's important to fully change um, positions every few hours when you're lying in bed. Um, but for your wheelchair, just make sure you're, you're moving around and you're shifting regularly. Um, so as I mentioned before, you watch the bony areas on your legs and back for any signs of pressure, uh, red areas that don't disappear within 30 minutes. Uh, you need to to contact your healthcare provider. Um, if you have to wait to see them, you need to avoid pressure on that area because we don't want it to, to open up. All right, so as I mentioned before, diet and nutrition isn't really something that you necessarily think about when you think about skin integrity, but it's actually really, really important. Um, and so I just went this, um, the link is to, uh, is to a really good article. Um, just outlining how important certain vitamins are um, to skin integrity and skin health. And so these particular vitamins um, are really important for repair of tissues um, and keep a good balance for all stages of wound healing. Um, and so it's really good to maintain a really, you know, a healthy diet. Um, so just some examples, you know, milk, yogurt, beans, eggs, meat, fish, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, all the things you would think of when you're looking at a healthy diet. Um, you can take a multivitamin, but um, do the ones that you can take like two or three times a day because the ones that you just take once a day, your body can't actually absorb it. Um, and so what you end up with is just really expensive pee. So they do make um, vitamins where it kind of breaks that up so that your body gets more of the vitamins and nutrients. Um, and so those are the ones that I, I would recommend. All right, the importance, the importance of hydration, I know, which I need to do right now. That was not planned, by the way. Um, so yeah, hydration plays a vital role in the um, preservation and repair of skin integrity. So dehydration disturbs that cell metabolism and can delay wound healing. And so adequate fluid, in, fluid intake is necessary to support the blood flow to those tissues to prevent additional breakdown. Okay. So when you're looking at how much you should have, um, you can look on any, any website, but for the healing of pressure ulcers, um, they do recommend for you to increase, um, especially if you have different things that are causing a volume loss. And so if you'll look in the 
this um, lower part here. So replacement depends on the volume losses experienced by the patient. So if you have a draining wound, if you have a fever, if you have a gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal bug, you're vomiting, you have diarrhea, um, that can cause you to lose fluids a lot quicker. And so you have to make sure that you're replacing those fluids that you're losing. Okay, so for different types of skin injuries, um, there are scrapes, abrasions, shearing. So those are the ones where it's just kind of, yeah, a scrape, abrasion. Shearing is, um, can be uh, in, in bed, um, even something like, you know, if you are kicking your feet at night and you don't realize, and it's causing that friction and that um, shearing, it can open the skin. You have your regular cuts and lacerations. And then what I see the most are the pressure injuries. So pressure injuries range from a stage one, which is just a redness that doesn't really go away, to a stage four, which is deep into the tissue. Um, a stage two, I'll go to the next slide and it'll show you. So the stage one here, um, you've just got some redness in this area, but the skin is, is not broken, okay? A stage two, the skin is broken down to that first level, a blister from a burn, um, or from just rubbing, you know, uh, I know I, I like to wear those little um, cute flats at the beginning of the summer um, until it starts to cause a blister on my heel and I don't like them so much. Um, but yeah, that is a stage two. Um, for a stage three, it gets deeper into the tissue and then stage four, as you would think, it gets even deeper. Okay, so um, recommended dressings, and I have some here. So for friction or shearing injuries, um, you always want to make sure with any type of um, opening in the skin that you, you clean it really well. Um, and then you dress it and try to remain off the site until it's healed. Um, when you do um, clean it, when you're trying to dry it, don't rub. Just you pat it dry because we don't want to do any damage to any of the tissue, okay? So when it says you uh, decrease, remove the cause and cover with a hydrocolloid dressing. So um, I don't know if you've seen any of these that are just kind of the, the plastic piece here. So it's really plastic, it's really stretchy. Um, you can cut them to fit um, and that will just prevent um, any rubbing. So it'll prevent from any uh, further rubbing. It also can be left on for up to seven days. It's waterproof. It should be fine in the shower as long as the ends don't start to peel up and will allow that site to, as long as there's no drainage, will allow that site um, to heal. For pressure injuries, same thing. Cleanse and uh, you clean it and pat it dry. Um, and then depending on the drainage amount, yeah, you would dress it. A thing I did want to mention, over-the-counter dressings, um, such as these here, like you get uh, the exact brand or the next care, um, they only really work if there's no drainage. Um, that's an eye patch. That's not the right one. Um, so yeah, they only really work if there's uh, no drainage uh, because these aren't meant to absorb. And so what happens is if there's a lot of drainage, it will sit on the gauze piece and then we'll just sit on your skin. And I'll, there are some uh, photos of a head um, that will show kind of what that looks like. Um, now, you do have to have the right type of dressing for the wound to heal correctly. I know at the beginning, Shauna was saying we don't recommend uh, any particular um, course of treatment that you'd need to see your HCP. But I did notice in um, the information that was sent to me before when you guys so lovely filled out the, uh, the questionnaire and it was very helpful for me to know what to put in this uh, presentation. Um, there were quite a few people um, whose question was, what do I do if I can't get to my doctor or I don't have a doctor or my doctor can't see me? And that's reality. So I would really like to, um, you know, help give you some information to, um, to know what to do if that was the case. That being said, um, I've got there a pause for next slide because the next slides that I'm going to show um, are photos of wounds. And so if you're a little squeamish, uh, you may want to just kind of turn and then I'll tell you when they're done. Um, but just so you know, the, the next photos are uh, actual photos of wounds. So, 
All right. So I know this kind of, um, it looks a little, it looks um, a little nasty, but uh, it's actually a really, really pretty wound. <laughs> it's healthy healing tissue. Um, you've got um, the nice borders here. Um, the area around is really nice and pink. The area on the inside, we call that red granulation tissue. It looks really nice and healthy. So this is what we want to see. Okay. And then we cover that um, with the dressing and we essentially allow that wound to heal from the inside out. Um, we make sure after we clean it and we pat it dry, um, once we decide what, how we're going to dress it, that we keep that wound closed because with the skin open like that, you are um, prone to infection. So we want to make sure that as we're um, changing it, we use the clean technique, um, wash your hands with soap and water. Um, all of these pa packages are sterile packages that these come in and um, dress, close the wound. And um, if it, you see there's uh, drainage, if you see that it's rolled up and it's no longer secure, you need to change that dressing. Um, so this is called maceration. And you can see the inside here, the inside of um, that wound is actually, it, it's actually healthy, like it's okay. But around here, it's way too wet. So when you're in the bathtub, if you notice the pruniness that you get on your fingers, um, that's essentially what's happening. And when I had mentioned these uh, kind of dressings like this, that's what happens with these because they don't wick moisture away from the skin. And if a wound is draining, we'll sit in that, the, the actual, um, sorry, that part of the dressing will soak up the moisture, but then it just sits on the skin. So it doesn't have a layer that protects the skin from the actual moisture. So again, that's why choosing the correct type of dressing is so important. And then these are some infected wounds. So you want to be aware of the signs and symptoms of infection. You see like this really red, 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 red area here. It was hot to the touch. This is one of our kiddos. Um, yeah, so really red, the, the redness extends way beyond the actual um, wound bed. Um, it was hot to the touch. It was um, raised, so it was swollen. Um, these white edges here, it was macerated, so it was getting um, too much moisture sitting on the skin. Um, there was some necrotic tissue here, so some dead tissue. Um, and then the, the inside was really red um, and, uh, and, and inflamed as well. Um, for these infected wounds, they're not something you can treat on your own. You would need to see a healthcare provider. Unfortunately, if you don't have um, a doctor that you can go to, you would need to go to eMERGE because these are the type of uh, infections that would need uh, an antibiotic. And this is a deep tissue injury. So for deep tissue injuries, um, the recommendation is really just to keep off of that area when it's you, you've got this discoloration because what if you continue to put pressure, um, the likelihood of it opening up and then you having the deep tissue injury and an open wound um, is, um, is likely. Okay, so for anyone that looked away, those, those photos are done now. Um, My dressings here, I can go over dressings a little bit more a little bit later. Um, sorry, I don't have time. What is the time? So, so you, you have time, in. Yeah. I have time. Go ahead. Yes. Cool. So if I'm talking too fast, I'm sorry. I tend to, uh, I tend to run out of time. So like I said, um, a question I got quite often, it was, what if I can't get to my doctor or I don't have one? Um, Again, the biggest thing is determine the cause of the breakdown and you have to fix that, okay? Um, and then for the wound, you uh, cleanse it with a mild soap and water, gently pat it dry, do not rub it, okay? Uh, pat it dry, cover with a dressing and monitor for signs and symptoms of infection, like I showed you. Again, that redness, um, if there's heat to it, if um, it's um, having... Um, drainage, uh, discolored drainage. Um, if there's any streaking from the actual wound bed, um, so if you're having little red streaks go from the wound bed, or if you have a fever, uh, definitely need to be seen uh, by a healthcare provider. 
So you're also going to want to offset the pressure in that area. So if it's on a certain side, lay on the opposite side or on your back. But again, when you're offsetting the pressure, um, you do need to be aware of where you're offsetting it because then you don't want to in turn get a pressure injury on the side that you're offsetting it. So, you know, continue to try to um, shift your body and uh, move your position so that that pressure doesn't continue on you know, a new, new area. Um, for heels, you can elevate uh, off the bed with, um, you know, like small roll up a towel, that, that even if it's elevated just that much to where it's not just putting pressure on the heel. Okay, in summary, prevention, prevention, prevention. Um, you address the cause of any redness. You do your skin checks in the morning and night. You decrease moisture on your feet, on your bum, in your groin. Um, wear shoes and socks and cover your legs to uh, prevent opening skin. Um, the knees, I, I didn't mention the knees before, um, but especially if um, you, know, you have kids that uh, crawl to get around the house, uh, up and down stairs, um, definitely make sure that uh, their legs are covered. Um, or if they're crawling around the house, they have um, you know, pads on their knees. Um, just, just make sure that um, the skin is protected. Um, proper fitting equipment and shoes. So we, as kids are growing, we have to monitor that equipment to make sure that the equipment is fitting properly. Uh, offset the pressure by having cushioning and shifting your body weight often. Always in uh, check those mattresses um, and on the wheelchair. And if you have an inflatable mattress on your bed, um, adapt a lifestyle to include healthy foods and lots of water. And then if skin opens, avoid pressure on the area until it can be treated. Um, so this is our initiative. <laughs> it's a very silly name. Uh, it's the Hospital Acquired Pressure, pressure Injury called the HAPI. Um, and it, again, just shows those pressure points, both when you're lying down um, and when you're sitting, to try to always check those pressure points. And uh, and make sure that there's no redness there. All right. So do we have questions? We do. All right. My first question is, can we get a copy of those happy handouts that we can give to right. are they available and on the website? I asked. So I asked um, before I came on and uh, we don't have them available yet. It's very, very neat. We just got posters printed and hung up in the hospital. We're trying to get um, a version that we can put online. Okay, so perfect. hopefully it is coming. Yes. Okay. Oh, um, um, I did, if I could just, I did have a person who, um, in one of the questions was asking about um, rectal sores. And so for that, I would um, have to just um, say again, so what, what is the cause? Um, is it, you know, constipation? Um, could it be a commode chair and we just need to try offloading? Um, you know, is, is the commode seat not fitting well? Is it causing the skin to stretch? Um, but again, addressing, addressing what the cause is. Um, it, it's hard to say for sure without knowing the exact situation, but those were the first things that came to mind. Um, are there, you know, that hard stool that's causing a rip or tear in the, in the rectum um, or seating? Um, and then there was another question about athlete's foot. Um, so that's the fungal infection. Um, you can get an over-the-counter to treat fungal infections, um, but, um, you know, if an over-the-counter isn't working, then that would be one where you would need to, to see um, a physician to get a stronger uh, antifungal. So I think those were the only two. Okay, thank you. So um, this question is uh, very personal, so I'm not sure if you can answer it, but uh, we'll, we'll go ahead with it. Um, I have a wound on my behind caused from bladder incontinence. I okay. have daily wound care, but it is not getting better. Mm -hmm. I also attend wound clinic appointments every two to three weeks for debriding. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have some answers. Okay. So um, I guess the question would be, what exactly are they dressing it with? So if you're having the increased moisture, but it's dressed, is the dressing that they're using um, preventing moisture from, from getting on the area? Um are they using something called a, let me find it here. Um, 
a dressing that has um, silver in it. Um, that can help a lot with uh, with the type of wound that you're describing. So it's it's actually um, a dressing that's embedded with silver. It'll be gray like this. Um, and it helps to um, prevent a lot of uh, wounds that are heavy draining, that are sitting in moisture and um, that are uh, possibly infected. Um, and it implants that silver into the actual wound bed, which can uh, help in healing. Um, and unfortunately for, for specific cases, unless I, you know, unless I can see it and know what they're using and, um, uh, the, the environment and it, it's hard to say specifically what, you know, what I think would help. Um, if you're going to, to a wound clinic and it's not helping, um, could you get a referral to plastics possibly, um, Sometimes um, wounds can be, you know, deep enough to where it might need a vacuum dressing um, if, if regular dressings aren't aren't helping. Um, but yeah, there's uh, there's so many variables to it that it's it's hard to say specifically. Um, yeah, Amy, on average, how long does the how long would an open wound take to heal on average yeah, it, for someone with spina bifida that has you know, maybe not the best circulation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and lack of sensation. So, so I mean, it really does depend on the person. But you know, I have kids that have come in with like a stage two, um, and within two weeks, it's healed. Um, but the parents are super diligent about changing the dressings. They're super diligent about making sure that it's clean and the dressing has changed. If they see that, um, you know, it's starting to come off or if there's drainage and that it's puffing up. Another thing about these particular dressings is um, I had all of these dressings ready to go. Um, they, have, they have a window on them. So I don't know if you can see this one. So they have a window on them that mm -hmm. will show drainage. So it'll show when it's starting to get full and that it needs to be changed. Um, they also will have a little picture. Some of them have a little picture on the front um, that shows right here. It has little drops on it. So that one's for just one drop. So it's for light drainage. If you have a wound that has moderate to severe drainage, then you need like dressings that are going to hold that and keep it away from the skin. So it really just depends on the person. But like I said, for a stage two, I've had kids that I would see them again uh, in two weeks and they're healed from that. In stage two, you definitely should see your, uh, your healthcare provider. For stage two, as long as it is um, not draining heavily, it doesn't have any of those signs and symptoms of infection, you can do it at home. But now, how, it's a, how do they get those specific um, dressings? Dressings? If it's not draining a lot, you can, uh, as long as you clean it, if it's not draining, you can use just these okay. next care. The big thing is if it's open skin, you want to make sure that you clean it and that you cover it. Um, you know, I, I can remember growing up, I would fall and I would, you know, scrape my knee or whatever. And my mom would be like, oh, no, you're fine. You know, just get, let the air get to it. The, you know, scab over and, and you'll be fine. But the truth of the matter is, once you cover it, if you allow the skin to heal from the inside out, you're going to have better healing. Um, you're not going to have an increased risk of infection, um, and your you know, chances of having scarring are decreased as well. So, that's a very good tip. Yeah, because I remember those days too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. And especially when, you know, if you have that decreased sensation, it's just, it's a different ball game. And so we really want to prevent uh, a further breakdown and we want to prevent infection. So you clean it and you cover it. Now, if you're noticing any signs and symptoms of infection, if you're noticing a lot of drainage, um, then I would recommend seeing your, uh, seeing your doctor. Um, again, I understand that that's, you know, that's often easier said than done. So if that's, you know, if that's the case. Um, and what I want to um, just impart, I guess, is, you know, make sure you're cleaning it, make sure you are um, finding the source of, of or finding the cause for the breakdown and decreasing or eliminating that cause. 
Um, and then once you clean it, then, you know, dressing it uh, properly. These, um, these particular dressings, they're expensive. I mean, not this just particular type, they make all different kinds. Um, they, you know, they can be expensive, but some insurances will pay for them. You can order them through Amazon, or you can order them through the actual, um, like this one's Merrick or Safety Tech. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I would assume in some of the um, home care. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, stores would have those kinds of yes. dressings as well. Yes. If anyone has a social worker that they work with, you can help with funding um, um, for, um, yeah, home health. They can, you know, possibly help with trying to um, navigate, you know, in your area if there is, you know, a, a place that will help with dressings. Um, that For the financial side. Yeah, you know, for the financial piece of it, or if there's any other funding that's, that's available. Um, you know, I think we have it, you know, in, in PEDS, we have it <laughs> a little easier because we don't really have to source out a lot of those things because it is available to us at the hospital. And just in pediatrics, it's it's a bit of a different ballgame than it is in adult care. And correct. Yeah, I fully acknowledge that. But, um, you know, finding the, the correct dressing um, to help prevent that moisture from sitting on there. And then it helps give the, the right pH balance for wound healing. So it's it's all a process and just allowing the body to do its thing, but you have to have the right dressing on it in order to for it to do that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question. We are applying Medi Honey to the ulcer per in-home nursing instruction. Um, what is your comment on that? I actually really like Medi Honey. Um, Medi honey, if you can afford it, it is expensive, but um, it's actually really good for cold sores as well. Um, it just, it um, allows a, a coverage over the wound that um, kind of, it almost debrides it in a way. So if there's any, um, uh, anything on the wound bed, any kind of like whitish, yellowish, we call it sloth um, in the wound bed, it kind of eats away at that a little bit, um, all while maintaining um, the integrity of, of the wound bed because it's covered, right? So the Medi Honey kind of covers the bed. Um, are you having success with it? Uh, we, we don't use it in the center, um, but I have definitely used it. I, I used to have a whole tube of Muddy Honey that I used on my cold sores and it worked. It worked wonders. Um, and then at the, the wound care conferences I've been to, I know in adult care, especially with uh, diabetic wounds that they they often, or uh, diabetic ulcers, that they uh, use Muddy Honey quite a bit. You mentioned diabetic ulcers. Is that something that our population should, you know, be aware of as well? Um, so I'm I mean, if you have comorbidities, then then yes. Um, I, I do feel like sometimes um, just because of the, the decrease or just total lack of sensation that, um, especially with uh, heel, some heel wounds that I've seen before, um, do act a little bit like a diabetic foot and just that the circulation is decreased. And so that's why prevention is so important because once it does open, it is harder to, to get it healed. Um, you know, when I mentioned before about like a stage two, um, we've had kids, you know, they've healed in like two weeks. Um, that's never been on a heel just because you almost always have pressure on that heel. <laughs> even if you're not lying down, even if, you know, if you're up in your AFOs, you're still going to have that pressure. Um, and so heels are one of the biggest areas, I would say, to really watch the, the heel and the tailbone, but right there in the, in the cox in sacral area um, because it's hard to fully have pressure off of those areas and still be able to, to function in your daily life. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, next question. Are there any creams to use for prevention? Um, and should I moisturize my daughter's skin every day? She's three and a half years old. Um, so... I mean, you, yeah, you can moisturize after, um, after a bath, make sure that, you know, she's fully dry, make sure to get in between the toes. Uh, we often see a lot of skin breakdown in between toes. 
schools because uh, it's not it's just not something parents think about. Um, if you're you know um, putting lotion on and there's any you know that's caked in between the toes or it's not fully uh, rubbed in and absorbed, then it can cause that. It could just kind of sit on the skin and, and cause a uh, breakdown it's, itself. But using lotion is, is totally fine. I also find for myself, um, when I'm getting, when I've been in the pool all day and I've had my water shoes on, mm -hmm. the between my toes will get like very white and kind of like milky yeah. looking. So yeah. you so really that's, that, that's where your sure skin that you clear, um, yeah. cl dry those off. Too. Exactly. So that's, yeah, your skin has absorbed all of that moisture and that's that kind of maceration or, you know, I was talking about. Um, so yeah, fully make sure that you're padding and, and you're getting those areas in between and underneath too, where your toes curl, like in underneath, make sure that you're getting those areas dry. Perfect. So this question is about um, calluses. I have a callus from spinning on my toe when transferring. It's mm -hmm. very deep, but closed and dry. Is there a way I can soften the skin and treat it without medical intervention? Um, so for calluses, um, I actually do usually recommend that um, our kiddos go to a podiatrist or a chiropodist, just because if you do have, have decreased or no sensation in that area and you're trying to deal with it on your own, um, the chances of you opening the skin are highly probable um, just because you can't feel when it's when you're getting to um to a, a nerve opening um and so you could just like be going along with you know with a, a pumice stone and you know then the next thing you, you know you're you're seeing blood um if you're really really not wanting um to get medical assistance with it um then you know after after bath you could try using a pumice stone. You can try softening it with uh, with lotion, but um, just because of that possibility of of not being able to feel if you're too close to that opening of that nerve opening, um, we we do recommend that you you see a podiatrist. They're you know they're licensed to yes. do um, kind of the the, sh the shaving down the it's called pairing. They're they're licensed to do that that pairing. Yes. Um, sorry, it's kind of jumping all over here. Mm -hmm. Um, did your slide indicate that LAL mattresses can cause dehydrated dehydration? Um, it just the sweating. Um, so the piece, uh, the piece from the mattress was, um, the, the sweating piece. So, um, um, I, I know I found when I was on inpatients, um, the spinal cord injury, uh, inpatient unit that, we really had to monitor um, the skin integrity on the back um, just because um, a lot of those uh, air mattresses um, caused our, our patients to sweat quite a bit. Um, and so because of the excess sweating, that means that you're, you're losing fluid. And anytime that you're losing fluid, you need to make sure that, that you're replacing it. So that was, yeah, that was the, the correlation between the mattress and the, the fluid loss. And what about people who use like um, pads on their bed? Because um, I myself use one to um, make sure that I don't you know, ruin my mattress. Mm -hmm. um, they make me sweat a lot. Oh, do they? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering what I can put or do um, to maybe stop that from happening. I just find that when you're laying on that all night long, Mm -hmm. um you do sweat quite a bit that's a yeah that's a good question I'm not familiar with um with those particular like the pads that you're using um I don't know if there are any other available that don't that don't cause that um yeah, they're all pretty much the same yeah. that I found but that's a good tip. yeah sorry okay. <laughs> no problem <laughs> Um, okay, this one is we use a padded commode seat, but when sitting on it, the bottom pushes downward and the seam of the seat created indentations on the skin. So what they did was wrap the commode with an additional towel to solve the problem. Is that a good fix for that? Or should they look at a different commode? Um, so I'm not, I'm not quite picturing 
what what the scenario is there. Um, so you have do you have a regular commode with a a pad? But what's indenting in the skin? I didn't quite understand. The seam of the seat created indentations on the skin. Oh, the seam of the seat. Um, and so I, I think so they they wrapped a towel around those seams. It, that's what it looks like to me um, to try and solve the problem of of when he's sitting on it for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, those seams kind of digging into a skin. Okay. Um, so, I mean, if, if the towel is, is working and not causing pressure, I mean, I know that kind of texture of a towel could, could possibly um, cause, I mean, I don't think it would be able to cause pressure in any certain spot. Would it be possible for the outside of the seams to just tape those seams down all around and then you'd still have the effect of the actual cushion piece? A good I don't think I don't think the towel would do, do any any damage. I don't know why it would. Okay. But maybe I mean up try to get the, like a maybe a soft kind of towel like yeah, not a really or, rough yeah. towel. Not a, not a right, yeah, and it would depend on like the the fluffiness of the towel too, right? So, um, because I know you know it it can also leave like a mark, like if you you know put pressure on a towel, just the the threads and everything on it, like it, it could leave um, a mark. mark. Um, but yeah, if the if the if it's one I'm picturing and the outside of it kind of where the plastic comes together and it it's got that little ridge all around it where the plastic two pieces, the top and the bottom, come together, try to tape that down so it doesn't. Um, it doesn't put pressure, but I may be I may be picturing it incorrectly. Um, if the towel is working and you're not noticing any pressure after he's off the toilet um, 20, 30 minutes and you don't see any little towel marks on him, then you should be OK. It's all about just watching for that pressure. And if you're noticing it and it's not going away, try something, you know, try something mm -hmm. different. Yeah, you want to you just want to eliminate what's causing pressure. So we only have a few more minutes left for questions. So I'm going to go to this one. Um, we use a triad hydrophilic wound dressing paste. Is any other recommended by you? Sorry, a triad hydrophilic wound, paste? Wound dressing paste, yes. Um, for, for what specific? Uh, they weren't specific on that. Mm -hmm. um, to be quite honest, I'm not familiar with the hydrophilic um, paste. Like I, 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 um, I know that there are pastes that they'll use if, if a wound is um, um, is kind of deep. You can put the paste in it um, and then cover it. And again, it just allows um, no air in between the top of the dressing and the bed of the wound. So it just kind of fills that fills that up. Um, and then with the hydrophil, it just allows a proper moisture balance. Um, so, I mean, I, I would think, you know, if it's, if it's working for you guys, then if it ain't broke, don't, don't try to fix it. Um, there are also ribbons that you can use. I don't think I have a ribbon here. Um, there's the Aquacel, uh, ribbon that you can pack with as well. Um, and there's the Aquacel AG, which is the silver that will infuse silver into uh, a one. And it's kind of looking um, like it might be getting infected um, to also pack it. But to, yeah, we think the, the paste would be a good option as well, as long as you're keeping that bed clean and you're keeping, um, you know, that area from getting anything into it. And then it's able to just heal from the, the bottom up. Bottom up. Mm -hmm. uh, this individual says, my skin takes so long to recover. And once it does, the color color is always very different. I also notice that my joints, the back of my neck, my armpits, and some private parts are extremely darker than my normal skin. Is this normal? Were the darker parts previous areas that had opened up would be my question. Um, or could it just be very dry skin? That would be my question. Or hyperpigmented, uh, pigmented, pigmented skin, blah, blah. Yeah. And the only reason I, I said that is because I have one little patch mm -hmm. on my knee that is very different than the rest of my skin. It doesn't yes. matter how much lotion I put on it. 
Mm -hmm. Um, it's always different color and it's always very dry. Yeah. Skin's a tricky thing. Um, and, um, you know, I find with our, our, um, spina bifida population, um, the skin is just so, so sensitive. And so, you know, we have kids who, um, yeah, same thing. They'll, they'll have, you know, their skin will change color after a wound. It'll be fully healed. I can tell the skin is, is beautiful. It's, it's intact. It's healed really nicely. Um, but then it's a diff, it's a different color because they're just so sensitive. And then I have other kids who will, you know, it'll heal and it's fine and, and you, you can't really tell. So, um, again, it's just, it's individualized, but with the, um, you know, the darker areas, it, it may just be pigmentation, but I'm, it's, it's hard to say without actually, without actually seeing it. And if it's not wound related, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not a dermatology nurse. So there's so many different things that can be with the skin that I, yeah, I couldn't even venture a guess. Okay. Well, thanks for trying. <laughs> <laughs> um, this question is about the silver, the bandages with silver in them. Can you buy them in the drugstore or do you have to purchase them from like a a healthcare store or um, by prescription? I, um, you know what? You can actually, you, I want to say that next care makes a, a, a silver one. I'm almost positive they do. Um, so I, I think you can buy them over the counter. Um, but again, the ones that are like, you know, these kind of that, um, you could probably get it um, shoppers home health, or you can ask your local pharmacy, um, if they can order them. A lot of pharmacies can, can order them and get them. They may have them in stock, but they are something that they can order. Um, something else, if you don't want to use like a full dressing, like silver dressing, um, is something called ribbon, um, to where you can just cut a piece that you need or a sponge, an AG sponge, um, and you cut it to the size that you need to fill the wound bed and just pop it in there. Um, and it may be a sheet this big and you're only needing a piece that big. And then you can, you know, continue to use the rest of it as, as you need it. Okay. And um, one last question. Mm -hmm. Can you please elaborate on vacuum dressings? How do they work? So vacuum dressings, uh, um, work by, um, it's, it's a huge sponge. It's like a sponge that's this big and you have to cut it to fit, um, the wound bed. You put it on and then you put, um, a very tight, um, couple of dressings over it. They're usually clear. Um, and then you attach an actual vacuum to it, um, to where it just, it sucks just like a vacuum does. And then you'll see this big, huge sponge go from this to that. Um, they're tricky because you have to get a proper seal on them. Um, and essentially what it does is it, it sucks all that moisture and everything up. And it's the purpose is to um, try to, to speed that healing um, and to just start um, um, circulation to get, to get the circulation and everything going up to the top of the wound bed to help stimulate healing. The word circulation. Totally just like <laughs> slipped my mind. Quite all right. Yeah. They're 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 tricky though. And they're um usually a home health nurse would come and um and change those. Um it's not something that you you can do uh, on your own. On your own. Mm -hmm. It's it's actually not something I'm super like I'm not uh trained. I've done them before, but it's been quite a while. So I'd have to be retrained on even on even doing them again. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Amy. This was very yeah. informative. Um, I hope everyone on the call got some good tips out of it. There's a few questions here that I might send your way just to I was see. I going to say, I, I see that there are more. So yeah, please send them my way and I will do my best to, uh, to try and answer them. Perfect. Thanks to everybody. Have a great night and we will chat soon. Bye, Thank Amy. Thank you.